Welcome to the Silmarillion Sessions. This is our third episode. I'm Dr. Mikhail Thompson. This is Mr. William Lassiter. And today we're going to be uh, diving into the Vala Quenta, the second book within the Silmarillion, uh, leading up to immediately preceding the Silmarillion proper. Uh, previous episodes we've discussed the, the work as a whole, and the Ainu Lindale, the singing into creation of the whole of Middle Earth on the part of God and the gods. And the Valaquenta is precisely the enumeration of and relationships of those gods, the, the sort of cataloging of those. But, but this is part of a much bigger concept, uh, the conversation that we began in the previous episode about the fall, mortality, and the machine. So as Tolkien tells us in the letter to his editor, you know, as he's submitting this, talking about the entire work, he says in, uh, this is letter 131, for those of you following at home, uh, that all this stuff, that is the whole of the Middle-earth legendarium, but in a particular way, uh, emphasized within the, 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 the Silmarillion, the series of works in the Silmarillion, all this stuff is mainly concerned with the fall, mortality, and the machine. So we've broached the topic, but I think I want to dive right in today and say, start with the question of what is the machine? What do you think, Mr. Lassie? Oh, great, great thing to, to, to kick off with. Um, I, I, I think in some ways, first off, I think Tolkien's very prescient in this. He's he's putting his finger on something which I th I think is the big bleeding uh, chest wound of the twentieth and twenty first century, um, and it's something with which I think emerges originally out of the Enlightenment period um, attempt to dominate nature. So whatever we're dealing with here has had a history of roughly three hundred years or so that it's been kind of growing or, or, or bleeding out. And in order to think about what the machine is, because that's really I mean, that's, a, that's a subject not just Tolkien, but of numerous other authors and writers and artists. Um, to think about it, I think we have to, to some degree, backtrack even a little further to mortality I itself. You know, what, what is the machine? So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and I'm read mm -hmm. Tolkien's letter, just that brief par par portion on the uh, mortality bit, as a sort of way into getting into the, what the machine actually is. Yeah. This is from letter 131. And I'll, um, I'll, put, I'll put this up here, if that's all right here. Um, there we go, share screen. Uh, Tolkien in 131, as you said, writing to his editor, and he says, mortality affects art and the creative, he says. It's a desire which seems to have no biological function. Art and the creative have no biological function. And as apart from the satisfactions of plain ordinary biological life with which in our world, it is indeed usually at strife. This creative desire is at once wedded to a passionate love of the real primary world and hence filled with the sense of mortality and yet unsatisfied by it. It has various opportunities of fall. It may become possessive, clinging to the things made as its own. The sub creator wishes to be the Lord and God of his private creation. He will rebel against the laws of the creator, especially against mortality. Now, part of why I bring that up is because he, mortality is pretty obvious. It's death. You know, it's, it's the fact that everybody's going to die. Here it is. The fact that everybody's going to die. So when we're talking about the, the um, fall, mortality, and the machine, mortality is a fact that no one here gets out alive. And in fact, not just humans, but everything around us is in constant decay. What we call, I think in, in science, is, uh, I think the term is entropy, right? That it, it's just falling apart, okay? That's an undeniable fact. And Tolkien suggests that artwork emerges out of, as a response to that undeniable fact. People look around and they see things dying and say, I'm creating art as a response to that, to make something permanent. You know, the, the Robert Frost poem, Nothing Gold mm -hmm. Can Stay, right? Or um, uh, William Butler Yeats wanting to, to make a, a, his self out of a thing, hammered gold and gold enameling to set upon an ancient power to, have, uh, to sing to kings of what is past and passing or to come. You know, this attempt to create artwork as something permanent 
that can defy the inevitable dissolution of all that's around us. And that's what he says. That's even even his creation of Silmarillion and Lord of the Rings is, is kind of a response to that. Yeah. And it, he says it's it's wedded to a passionate love of the real primary world. So artists are are deeply in love with the real passionate world, or with the real primary world. They're passionate right. about it. But because of that passion, that love for the real primary world, they're also going to constantly be aware that what they love is going to be falling apart. It's dying. And so, so as he this, said, this sorry. Galadriel kind of attitude, the yes. Galadriel sort of outlook of fighting the long defeat. Yes, exactly. Fighting the long defeat. Right. Um, and so, as he says, there are numerous opportunities for artists, especially in the creative, the, the creative person, particularly to fall away from the pattern, the order, the obedience, uh, the law of God, whatever we want to call it. And it is also possible, he says, for the person to become possessive of the beautiful thing they've created, which, hint, hint, foreshadowing, we will see as one of the first major stories in the work, right? I mean, it's, it's the story in the work. Right. <clears throat> to fall in love with the very thing that you created in order to stop mortality. And because of that, you bring yeah. more mortality back into the world, ironically enough. Right. But as he says, then, there's this other response which is not artwork okay and that's both the both the artist that falls in love with his creations and wants to make them permanent or wants to destroy other things so that his art survives he's rebelling but there's another rebel that rebels against the creator uh especially against the mortality the creator has put in the world or has, has come into the world and there's where we get into the machine okay the, the, the machine idea mm -hmm. Um, and I am of the opinion, I mean, just to cut to the chase, when he talks about the machine, I'm of the opinion that that response is only partly having to do with the mechanical things that we create, okay? It's only partly it. It's much more, I think, an attitude or a stance towards mortality of creator and creation, okay? So, mm -hmm. in other words, um, when... He, I'll use the mouse as an example. This is a machine. It's a tool. It's something that's been created by humans in order to accomplish something. In and of itself, there's no evil there. Any more than there's evil in, say, an automobile, or there's evil in the TV, or the internet, or the atom bomb. There's not technically, there's not evil in it. Um, but they are part of something which Tolkien seems to suggest isn't evil. It's a It's a rebellious form against the the inevitable fact of mortality. So I would, so, so I, let me just finish here the, with this mm -hmm. idea. The machine, I think, is a mode of thinking, right? And it's a mode of thinking where, where human beings, in, in fact, the world is not a end in itself anymore. It's a means to an end. It's, it's, um, it's a means to overcome mortality. Um, and therefore, as, as I'll, show a little bit further down the road therefore everything in this mode of thinking is a resource human beings trees plants animals water air everything is a resource to be stockpiled for the accumulation of power that's what i think the machine is okay now I'll, let me pause for a second okay so essentially the um the, there's there's two responses then from what I'm hearing you say, there's there's two essential responses to the fact of mortality mm. and decay. One is the artistic response, and that is the creation of beautiful things, um, in many ways for their own sake. Right? It's 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 an end in itself. It yeah, serves no biological right, function need. Right? Then there's this other response, like the response of well, this response of rebellion against not only the fact of mortality, but rebellion against reality to then manipulate things. So rather than cultivating something together, so we've got two different kinds of responses. And, and this is, I think, a bit like what we saw in the Aino Lindale, where we can see there uh, is Melkor response. Melkor is 
activity within the, sy the, the symphony of creation. So Iluvatar calls all the Ainur whom he, who have sprung from his thought uh, to sing a great, to make a great music together. And, and that, of course, becomes the creation of the world. And Melkor is singing, uh, he, he goes off and does his own thing and it becomes dissonance. And he sings essentially against the grain, uh, the, against everybody else, rather than in harmony with everybody else. And so that's that's precisely this this rebellion, um, this acting out. So that we're talking talks elsewhere about the 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 act of creation artistically, the artistic mode of creation. The artist is a sub creator. He's participating. So when we with a, when a person creates art, we're participating in the act of create in the in the primal act of creation uh, that God or the gods singing the universe into creation, we're now becoming sub participants in that, uh, to create a secondary world of some sort is the terminology that Tolkien uses, uh, at least refers to referring to the creation of literature, but this, this Melkor kind of approach, now that's something else. You're not creating that. You're not participating as a sub participant. You're not participating as sort of the sub creation according to the order of things. You're rebelling against the order of things. It's this attempt to manipulate things, um, for your own for 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 some end and so if it's a if it's a mode of thinking then in many ways this is something that's sort of primal that comes from you know the original fall this primeval state that man was in and we've chosen to take things to rebel against the order the the, the established order of things to take things into our own hands but it seems to me though that it's so it's a mode of thinking and you can say well it's something from from the beginning but we've seen something very particular arise in the last few centuries at an accelerating pace, you know, and, and I know somewhere recently I was reading an article, it's been suggested that this mode of things, maybe, maybe this mode of thinking or its development within civilization, within humanity is essentially exponential. And so, yes, it's something that's been there from the beginning, but we've seen it. Now we've sort of noticed all of a sudden these massive leaps, uh, over the last few hundred years, especially in the last 100 years, especially in the last 10 years, especially in the last five months. You know, it seems to be rapidly accelerating. Um, do you think that's fair to say that Ooh, yeah. both and the same, it's something that's been here from the beginning of humanity as an impulse? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. it's just simply taken on a new form recently. Yeah. You know, recently, historically speaking. Absolutely. And, you know, all of us in the modern world have been trained to think that the modern world is the paragon of a long series of evolutionary advances. Okay. Mm -hmm. It ain't necessarily so, Jackson, okay? That, that may not be how the, the unfolding of time actually is. Right. Um, one has to ask, why is it that for the majority of the human culture thing on Earth, we have not had flying instruments? We have not had Flugzeug. We have not had Luftwaffe. Mm -hmm. Why is it for the majority of human existence there was no internet? Why is it for the majority of human existence we have not had um, uh, traffic snarling problems with automobiles? You know, right? This because is... it seems that kind of thing is of a fundamentally different order than merely creating a flint right. knife right. to cut things and make fire. Right. But the, but you're absolutely correct. I think in saying that the what the urge or the tendency is there because that's precisely the tendency that we see in Genesis, for instance, with the, with the mm -hmm. eating of the apple. It's precisely the tendency we see in Cain murdering Abel, precisely mm -hmm. the tendency we see in the building of the Tower of the Babel. Tower of Babel yeah. But over and over again, we have instances of it happening, even though they don't have internet. I mean, they still accomplish the Tower of Babel mm -hmm. without the internet. So it's a tendency in human beings, but, you, but the exacerbation or the acceleration that you were describing, the exponential acceleration, I think is a very real thing and I think it, history is odd because there are a lot of things that go into any event. Mm -hmm. I think what happened was that there was a break in the Western mind that occurred in the 13th century, began in the 13th century. And I've referred to this elsewhere, which is the scholastic collapse. And I mm -hmm. think it broke the Western mind, began to break the Western mind. And, and after break in the that, sense of splitting it in two. Yes. Yeah. Yes, a schizophrenic split, right. Uh, um, and after that, it began to develop in such a way, or one half of it developed in such a way, if you will, that um, materialism was the thing, that was all there was, the material mm -hmm. world. And when all you have is the material world, the only thing you can look for is the quest for power. And I think that that led to then that attempt in the Renaissance to rebuild culture based on classical modes, 
And I think, which, you know, there's a lot of good there, certainly. But even men like Michelangelo and Da Vinci, who were already tinkering with machines, were tinkering with devices that could accelerate man's ability to dominate the world. And when you get to the 16, 1700s, that's where it becomes explicit rather than implicit. I think their yeah. the attempt was to dominate the world, to break men free of the cycles of nature. And yes. they succeeded. And that's, that's interesting because that's, you know, this utility mindset, uh, uh, you, you, in the sense of what it was, the utilitarian sort of mindset, that, that right. nothing is an end in itself, but it's all a, a means, something that can be mined for the accumulation of power. Um, like you said, that, that seems to sort of begin, you know, really take its full form in the Enlightenment, but has some, you know, in the preceding centuries, uh, becomes increasingly a marked thing. Yeah. Um, you know, this seems to me, and I, I just, be, I was recently teaching, um, oh, what is it? The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis's Essays oh, yeah. in the Abolition of Man. He cites specifically Francis Bacon as the, the great herald of this new way of thinking, uh, with his, you know, phrase of man's conquest of nature. But this seems mm -hmm. to mark the definitive shift. It doesn't certainly doesn't begin it, but it, it's a definitive marker, a definite marker into this techne mode of thinking over the contemplative mode. The, it's the te technical manipulation of reality yeah. versus um, beholding of reality. I um, totally agree. I but, totally agree because prior prior to yeah. Bacon's uh, statements and prior to the project of the Enlightenment, people were always hampered in this tendency. By the fact of mortality, they they could not overcome it, and they were, and all of the mechanisms of society were there in order to remind people of their mortality, remind them that this mm -hmm. is too high to fly. It's 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 uh, Icarus, you know, you're you're going to get burned by the sun. Um, you're going to be Achilles, and your best friend's going to get killed. Uh, there's going to be the ruination of society, and all these these things were reminding people that this was the case, and come. Uh, Francis Bacon, and all of a sudden you've got people beginning to say, maybe we can actually overcome uh, nature. Maybe we can break the cycles of of nature. Mm -hmm. And then that 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 potentiality of wanting to dominate the world, wanting to um, have power to, to overcome even mortality, was was released. A, a tremendous energy was released. And, and you see in the 70s especially, person after person after person studying things that were not studied before, looking at things that were not looked at before, mm -hmm. making connections, communicating. You know, and it's really stunning to me because we often, again, think that there wasn't a lot of travel and there wasn't a lot of communication before the you know, 1700s. It's, it's just not true. You look well, at the ancient world. hogwash. We've yeah, got no, records all over the place. And, and, and they were traveling as far back as Neolithic times. I was just oh, reading yeah. about uh, like Phoenician, Phoenician beads that were found in Alaska. Well, how mm -hmm. do you get Phoenician beads to Alaska? And these were like ancient beads, you know, and how do you get there? Well, you travel. And so people were moving all over the world and they were talking oh, yeah. with each other constantly. So that wasn't the issue. The right. issue was, I think, that there was a, uh, a mental shift that occurred and suddenly you've got people studying things, looking at things, um, examining things, putting things together in a way that was completely different than how they were doing so before. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And that's, you know, as I was trying to think as you were talking about um, Da Vinci and Michelangelo, is that, you know, they are living in a period, I mean, the whole, the, the, whole, the, re, the Renaissance, with a capital R, uh, that refer to it, is not the Renaissance. It's, it's, not, it's not the only one. Right? There have been no. Renaissances every couple of hundreds of years <laughs> prior to that. There's various yeah. cultural re-flourishings and rebirths of, of culture and civilization. But this one is called the Renaissance because there is a marked definitive shift that it's, no, it's not just a Renaissance, but there's a, there's a shift in consciousness uh, within certain societies in the West, and it spreads of this this want to revive the ancient Roman Greco Roman civilization. Yeah. Like all of a sudden, which means there's two things going on. One is all of a sudden a very different kind of historical consciousness that that's more of a linear thing rather than a well we are a people we've always been a people and we're in direct relation to eternity, and yeah sure things come and they go and they die, but there's not necessarily a linear sense of histor history and historicity marching yeah. forward. All of a sudden that seems to be a thing. And uh, also then, some might say a sense of hubris, but like 
they're looking back to ancient Greece and Rome and saying, hey, look at Virgil, look at look at Horace, these, all these guys. And they were great and they were pagans. We're Christians. We can do it even better, right? Because yeah. we've got divine, we've got divine revelation. You know, we can do it, but this time with Jesus. And essentially <laughs> like that's, that's the, that's at least in Italy, this, this, the Renaissance. Sure. In yeah. the, the 14th century, starting the 14th century, 15th century, is that's the shift that we see. And we see it in art uh, along with it, but it seems to be a historical consciousness, um, a, 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 histor a, a paradigm shift in the way we think about time and history, as well as, you know, riding on, and they're probably related in some way, riding on that nominalist shift mm -hmm. that happened a few centuries earlier. And, uh, and we have to take into account that societies normally shift philosophically after a massive uh, shock to the system. There's mm -hmm. some kind of cataclysm that happens in the society first, and then that kind of, that allows a shift or promotes a shift. So for instance, like the, the Black Death that hit Europe and wiped out one third of the population, devastating in the 1300s, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. By the late 1300s, you had a shift economically because so many people had died, there weren't enough people to do the jobs. And because of that, people were thinking, well, I'm worth more. I should get paid more. And suddenly they're getting paid more for the jobs that they have been doing prior uh, for, for very low pay or no pay at all. And that's a, that's a, that's a fact. I mean, there was even a riot of the Watt, so the Watt Tyler revolt, I think that occurred in 1380s. Right. That basically they, they demanded to have decent pay and they, they marched on London and had to be dispersed. Well, what, I, what I'm getting at is, the philosophy of I'm worth more, I need to be paid more is a cultural philosophy, a shift in, in thinking about yourself as a cultural unit. But it only occurred because that massive shock to the system occurred prior to it of the Black Death. Mm -hmm. And then the vacancies were there and the, and the shift occurred and people thought, oh, you know, this is, this is necessary. So if we're looking at what happened, the 1300s were a disaster, generally speaking. And that led to a rethinking of what we're about in the 14 and 1500s, which we now call the Renaissance. But then that didn't work either. And you right. had 1600s, which was just nonstop warfare. Right. Because you had so the introduction the of mechanized weapons. Yes, 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 yes. And at the end of that, what do you see? You see the emergence of the Enlightenment movement. There's got to be yeah. a better way. Right. Uh, and, and mechanized weapons led to mechanized production of goods and mechanized um, government and mechanized economy and, and mechanized military and me everything became machine-like, mechanized. Right. So much so that in the, what was it, early 1800s, I think, you had cloth makers who prior to this had done all the cloth making by hand. They were being replaced by machines. And they were so distraught by this because they were all losing their jobs over these machines. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like uh, Taco Bell, right? Taco Bell now is automated. You don't have to have employees anymore, and so you just go up and the thing like shoots out of a, a shoot into a bucket and you eat it through a spoon or whatever the heck it is. You know, you say this. I mean, this is true. <laughs> Cameron, this is happening awful. in America right now. You have these machines that like like you know fart food out for you out of a tube into a thing and you're like oh yeah it's, it's like literally the recreation of those renaissance paintings of the golden calf defecating <laughs> out the coal yes, it really is oh but, my goodness you know, a similar thing was happening in the day to these cloth merchants and cloth manufacturers and so in order to stop this they revolted and they busted up the machines whenever they could and they frequently take their wooden shoes and the throw sabo them. and the sabo yeah. yes and that's why you have a saboteur, because a saboteur, right. who was, they were also referred to as Luddites, um, after, mm -hmm. after Lud, King Lud, but they, they basically were trying, legitimately trying to save their way of life, because their way of life mm -hmm. was being replaced by a machine that could produce right. war, and therefore humans weren't necessary. That sounds very familiar, I know, in a lot of ways now. But it was a very similar thing that was going on there at the end of the 1700s, mid, mid to end of 1700s, because that enlightenment thing had shifted again to be basically, um, we're making dark satanic mills and you can't stop us. That's the way things are mm -hmm. gonna be and it's gonna happen in every single instance. Dark satanic mills, what's, what's that? Well, that's William Blake. Yeah, it's another thing. You know, prior to the early 1800s, because Blake is late 17, early 1800s, prior to Blake, you don't really see a great many artists griping about the machine. 
the great right. artists, if you know, go back to like Shakespeare, for instance, Shakespeare argues against bad government and he argues against bad people. And he argues mm -hmm. even about the possibility that this world is all there is. You know, there's a deep strain in him of that struggle between nominalism and realism. But mm -hmm. Shakespeare doesn't ever have in any of his works this idea that the machine is taking over. Okay. Yeah, that just doesn't seem to be a concept that we see in the literature at that point. Yeah. No, no, and that's that's early 1600s. Mm -hmm. And um, then roughly in this, the writers of the 1600s, you get Hobbes, for instance, who's writing sometime in the mid to late. And Hobbes is beginning to noodle this, right? That maybe mm -hmm. we need a machine in government because things are so damn bad. You have to have somebody right. beating us over the head regularly. And he, he kind of advocates that in Leviathan. Um, and you've got uh, you've got other characters writing at that time, but you don't see a great many. I mean, if you look at some of the earliest ones, like um, the, the the novel Tom Jones, uh, which is it, it's it's kind of talking about society as comic, but there's not a lot of this machine thing going on. By the mm -hmm. time you get to so the 16 and 1700s, you really don't get a lot of that idea of machinery in literature. <laughs> By the time you get to 1800s, William Blake, William Blake in his poem, Jerusalem, especially, and he rails against mm -hmm. it in London and in the um, Songs of Innocence and Experience and, and, and um, the, the Book of Thel. All these books are about this horrible thing he sees on the horizon happening to society that society is being drained of its essence by this machine mentality that's taking over. And Blake basically writes in Jerusalem, uh, see if I can get it. Did those feet in ancient times walk among England's mountains green and was the countenance divine on England's pleasant pastures seem? Uh, and uh, he says, bring me my bow of burning gold, bring my arrows of desire, bring me my chariot of stars unfold, bring me my arrow, uh, something for the chariot of fire. I mm -hmm. will not cease from mental strife, nor shall my sword rest in my hand till we have built Jerusalem among this, uh, bright and pleasant England's... land and in yeah. the midst of that poem he talks about these dark satanic mills that um that are dominating the landscape so, yeah, yes and i think that's where we I can read that coming. passage well, he said and did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills and was jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills right right so he's setting up all these instances of the divine and the lamb of god and the holy pastures and then he sets them in that second stanza against that image of mm. dark satanic mills for the first time that phrase shows up in an english language and the for the first time it's it's uh, appearing in 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 this poem the dark satanic mills are the thing he's fighting against so all that imagery that comes afterwards of the burning bow and the arrows of desire all that is there in order to combat this sense that we're being taken over by a, uh, a thing. And, I, and, and if I'm not mistaken, Dark Satanic Mills actually refers to a revolt against a, 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 a mill that had been me mechanized, basically. So mm. um, I'd have to look that up, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. So he was responding to this idea already that um, machines will do all our work. Humans aren't going to be necessary anymore and the landscape will be ordered and structured and dominated in a machine-like way right well that's an interesting thing because that's you know something too that we don't have in shakespeare it seems we start to get and not just be in shakespeare with others you know contemporaneous contemporaries with him with um but we do see a little bit in um hobbes mm -hmm. I, I would argue i think more than at first meets the eye this notion that man is a part from nature that in the sense of the world somehow there's a shift to where man is hum, human beings man as a thing is somehow distinct from the environment around him yeah. he's no longer part of the same world yeah. he interacts with it somehow is is in it but doesn't belong to it and that's another conceptual shift that seems yes. to have taken place yes it, it is a conceptual shift and honestly it um again i would put it in the mid to late 1700s that that conceptual mm -hmm. shift occurs Prior to that, you've got nature as a terrifying force or a dangerous force or a, um, a force that simply you interact with. So, for instance, right. going back to like Decameron, for instance, or yeah. Chaucer, that's yeah. in the 1300s. People are just 
in nature. They're in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. They're traveling through it. You know, they're they're retreating from the city to to a remote villa in nature. You know, mm -hmm. in the uh, fourteen and fifteen hundreds, uh, you've got the idea that human beings are simply part of that natural order, and the natural order is scary sometimes. Much. But it's just Macbeth is it very is. much showing this for the first time in in Western culture. That's in the mid mid to late seventeen hundreds. For the first time in Western culture, you not only get man as separate from from machines with Blake, but mm -hmm. you get an almost overly conscious attempt for man to interact with nature. In yeah. other words, if you look at like Wordsworth, for instance, or even Coleridge or um, mm -hmm. the other romantic writers, they are conscien consciously trying to reconnect with nature. Same thing with Walt Whitman and Henry Thoreau and those American writers. They wouldn't need to, they wouldn't need to consciously reconnect with nature if they hadn't felt the separation from nature. Right. right. That just sounds like it's a nonsensical thing for your average you know, 14th century Englishmen. No. Yeah, you no. know, it just, it but just wouldn't... wouldn't think that way. You know, they, right. for them, it was like nature. You know, you look at the, the Trey Reshures, right? The book of the hours, people yeah. are just doing nature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, in all its manifestations in different yeah. marginalia. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, which is also why, you know, for those who, just a, a slight brief discourse here, those who get into uh, medieval illuminated manuscripts, uh, modern people who look at some of these things and the things that are drawn in the margins, uh, you know, are best scandalized, so at, at, you know, at minimum, you know, snicker and giggle over, <laughs> you know, some of the activities that we see people doing at the margins of these holy books is that's just a much more natural thing. It, it didn't seem it, for, for the person actually drawing it, it doesn't necessarily seem out of place No, yeah, because the world is, is more of a, well, a united patterned whole and not this sense of fragmentation where right. man stands apart from nature and therefore has to have some sort of intermediary to interact with it. Those yes. mechanisms, tools, machines. Yeah, for the medieval, especially the medieval who lived in a some more bucolic rather than a, a, an urban environment, right. um, the, 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 the na nature was always there. I mean, you had mm -hmm. animals uh, living, dying, uh, creating little animals through animal copulation, uh, pooping everywhere, stinking up the joint, getting slaughtered. You know, and cooked and put on a table, mm -hmm. and it was it was there. It was like you were. There's no way to have escaped it. You know, no, it's and, just um, it was just a thing. <clears throat> it's just life. You're surrounded it's by life. life, and even even in the uh, cultures of the civilizations of the Mediterranean that are principally urban, say like Italy, m much of Italy for much of its history has been uh, city based, town based. You know, we would call them towns, but they self contained political units that are cities. Even within the cities here, cities were not wall-to-wall, -wall, you know, corner, what do you, uh, you know, wall-to-wall -wall apartments all across, you know, even beautiful stone ones. There was a lot of open space within these yeah. cities, terraces that are gardens, open fields within the city walls, which is just a practical thing, because if you're ever besieged, you still can feed yourself. Yep. Uh, livestock in the cities, often living on the ground floor of even bourgeois houses in, in the middle of the town. You had at least a horse or mule or something or cows. Um, you're still surrounded by it, even in the ancient form of city life. But this right. new this new modern city life, this is something different. Very, um, very different. And I think, I think that topic of reaching for power, like it's, you know, you've got to have the machine then to manipulate this, the, the machine mechanism, you have to have mechanisms to manipulate uh, nature in some way in order to exert power, in order to manipulate um, other men, in order to exert power, to have power, to have um, fame. This seems to me also a shift in the way that science is done. Um, and is illustrated, I think, in, in two, two texts, two other literary works of the you know, early 19th century. Um, and that's, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Johannes Goethe's version of Faust, mm -hmm. Dr. Faustus, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in Goethe's Faust, he has Dr. Faustus, who's allegedly chasing after knowledge, right? So he's the old, you know, the old type of seeking knowledge, maybe, you know, beyond the bounds, right? So he, you know, science is now tired him. He's, bo he's blown through science. He's going to move into alchemy and sorcery. Right. Okay, that's a type we've seen before. It's something we've been warned against, you know, throughout the ages. 
But here he shifts and he's trans, it opens, you know, this is a pivotal moment where Dr. Faustus is sitting, he's trying to translate the prologue of the Gospel of John from Greek into German. And, and you know, just you know, translate it into English here because I don't recall the German terms, but he's translating it in Anarchi en Hologos. We talked about this in the creation bit about the Analingole. Uh, in the beginning was the word, but Logos can also mean meaning, word, significance, essence of things. Um, and he's trying to translate that. He doesn't like the idea of word. You know, that's knowledge, he's, that, that's played out. And he's shifting it, he says, in the beginning was meaning. Uh, you know, that's not quite sufficient, you know, it's a little esoteric, okay, we're getting somewhere, you know. Uh, and he decides, well, knowledge and the knowledge of the meaning of things gets us to some certain end. And so we have in the mouth of Dr. Faustus, a sort of internal monologue here, this shift from seeking knowledge, from contemplation, from seeking knowledge to power, he says, knowledge is power in the beginning was power mm. there we go now i like that and that's when this little black dog that followed him home all of a sudden shifts into the demon mephistopheles and says i can help you uh and, and then all things go right from there that's a great image that's i mean it's such a great image because it's like all of a sudden this nice little doggy nature if you will yes uh, yeah. shifts and becomes a demon guess right. what that's plutonium and then their hills <laughs> that's right there's plutonium in their hills uh, that's, and it's, that's amazing. And his character shifts from somebody who's seeking knowledge to all of a sudden reveling in the guns, girls, and gold that he gets and destroying people's lives in the process. Yeah. I mean, exactly. and then Frankenstein, of course, Dr. Frankenstein, again, begins with alchemy, inveterate interest in knowledge, but it's not, that's not where his problem ends. If that were it, he would just be another crazy alchemist, evil sorcerer yeah. or something, you know, goes down in history with, you know, for time out of mind, these, these types of characters. But he, what is his thing? He, when he's retelling his tale, is that it led to him, he wanted to imbue inanimate matter, you know, dead matter, inert matter, with life, mm. right? He wanted to grant a soul to inert matter. And it was not so much because, you know, at first, his, he, he tells us that at first his impulse was, well, this could be useful. You could bring people back to life. But really, he shifts beyond that. That to say, well, yeah, okay, that's fine and good, but think of how famous I would be. Think of the glory that I can win for myself. So this is about power. This is a power of reputation that he can have in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why he creates this, this creature, right? This creature who becomes ugly precisely because he's manufactured rather than grown. Yeah, and I love that work. I understand you're teaching that right now. I, I mm -hmm. loved teaching that work. Um, Mary Shelley, for all of her faults, the, maybe the least of which is being married to Percy Biss. But for all of her faults, she had, she really touched on something tremendous. Yeah. I think that novel, especially the first rendition of it, because she boulderized some of it later on. But yeah. there's something in that story which I found really intriguing. First off, he tries, his motive for trying to discover whatever he's just trying to discover is prompted by the death of his mother, the horrible yes. death of his mother due to pox, I right. think. And so he's traumatized mm -hmm. by that, and he wants to find a way to fix death, mortality, vis-a-vis right. -vis Tolkien, right? Exactly. And so he uh, goes and he creates this body out of body parts, out of cadavers, and he puts it all together and he electrifies it, puts electricity into it, and it becomes alive. And one of the right. startling things to me in that story is that, yeah, we all think the Frankenstein monster is hideous, but... Dr. Victor says the complete opposite. He actually says yeah. it was beautiful. It was exactly. glorious. He uh, was, and, it's much more, it's much more, um, oh goodness, the name of it. Dr. Frankenfurter, help me out here. Frankenstein? Can't be, not, can't be a uh, cult flick from the 70s, 80s. Um, <laughs> Tim Curry. Uh, not Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes, Rocky Horror oh, Picture Show. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say that was a long shot. I didn't think anybody else knew about Rocky Horror. <laughs> Throwing the Every, baloney everybody off. feels that way, William. We, we, we've okay. all been there. <laughs> yes. Um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. A wasted night. Actually, yes. He, because, you know, he's been building a man with strong arms in a tan. Uh, <laughs> yes. And it's that's actually closer to to the story than the old black and white horror flick. <laughs> I never so thought he's, of that. he's creating a beautiful guy. 
Yeah. But he's ghastly once he's actually imbued with life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? It's almost like a metaphysical ghastliness, yes. though, because it's he's something that should be the, alive and is. All the uglier for the beauty that he gave him. Right. But this yeah. is, again, this is the instance of the machine. Because what you also realize in that, that novel, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, is that the monster is actually mm. a gorgeous Eton graduate. Yes. Is somebody who has graduated from the English system uh, and is still young and beautiful, hair slicked back and everything, and he knows all this stuff, and yet he is monstrous. He is right. not really alive. Yeah, and, and he, yeah, because he he learns speech, yep. and he's quite well-spoken, and he's not just this, you know, kind no, it's, of thing. It's it not was, like young Frankenstein. No, <laughs> <laughs> but another Ritz. <laughs> He's actually very articulate. He has a long monologue in the middle of the story yep. where he's recounting his tale. Yep. And he's yep. very well spoken, even for his era. And and that I think is But what he's got this what, nasty habit of killing people. Yeah, right. It's just, you know, a small thing. But I think that with Shelley, what she was seeing was that this type of mentality, the machine uh, mentality, she, though she didn't call it that. Yeah was producing human beings who no longer saw value in life or living and had no point themselves in living except exactly. for power and that's really exactly. um that's really pointed out in a section there which is the trial of a young girl i forget her name but she's accused of i think just justine something. justine so, that's right so the monster kills the monster finds a young boy and decides he's going to kidnap him and make him his his companion. Yeah, it's creepy, very creepy part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like a lot of news of the last couple of decades. Um, but he's, uh, you know, and and, and then the, the kid says, "You know, I'm going to tell my daddy he's he's Monsieur Frankenstein," referring to you know a relative of, of Doctor Victor Frankenstein, his dad, in fact. Um, and he says, "You're a Frankenstein." Oh, I'm going to kill you because I'm gonna, I, the first chance to inflict punishment on That's my right. maker. That's right. Because right? he, he's loathing the fact that he was even created. And so then he strangles the boy and he fr he's learned, in the, the monster has learned enough law and history um, by studying, diligent study, uh, to know how to frame somebody, to get, yeah. to get away with murder literally and frame somebody else and so he does and he he frames the innocent justine and she is hanged in yep. full justice because the evidence was incontrovertible and victor frankenstein is there at the trial if i remember right yes. he's horrified but he doesn't stop yes. he doesn't do a damn thing he's like oh my god i'm the murderer i'm the murderer but he doesn't speak up because his reputation because his power because yes. his fear and 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 if you ever read e michael jones article on Frankenstein, it's really a brilliant observation that he makes about the whole novel. But he says in there that the Justine character was probably based upon a, um, sorry kids, plug your ears, a uh, BDSM erotic novel by the Marquis de Sade named oh, sure. Justine. Okay, the novel's name was Justine. And there were only yes. like five or six copies in the world. And oh, wow. It, and it was uh, it was horrendous. I don't need to go into the graphic details, but it was horrendous. Mm -hmm. And the gist of it was a young girl gets basically seduced and eventually killed in a horrible way. Um, it's a Fifty after, Shades of Ray girl. Yeah, uh, yeah, God yeah. Perfect. It's like that. Yeah, it's like that. Uh, and we're now so like dulled to it. We don't even. Oh, it's a big deal. At the time, it was so shocking that the that the mark that the the Marquis de Sade who wrote it was already a degenerate fella. But mm -hmm. all copies were banned. They just they were not distributed anywhere. But Lord Byron had a copy. And Lord Byron was there at the Chateau in Switzerland when Mary Shelley and Percy Biss, Byron's friend, came to visit during the year without a summer. And while right. there, uh, they told these stories and she created the story of Frankenstein to some degree based upon Byron and Shelley. Sure. And so it's possible, Jones says, that the Justine section is based upon this Justine novel by the Marquis de Sade. And the real point of that is that if if one adopts this machine mentality that prompts Victor to create the monster, one of the first victims of that machine mentality is the female sex. Yes, Women the, the innocent ones. child and the woman, the young precisely, woman. Precisely, precisely, precisely. Because mm -hmm. women become nothing more than, as the Marquis de Sade said, and this is so sick, 
women are machines for voluptuousness. Mm -hmm. That's it. In other words, they're sex robots for the Marquis de Sade. The machine mentality makes human beings into machines, but it also makes women especially into sex bots, which is horrible. Right. And again, if we're, we're developing, just so our audience knows, we haven't lost the thread completely. We're developing what Tolkien was responding to when he called this thing the machine. Right, and it comes, you know, you think that this is a stray from Tolkien, but you go and read, not before you're 21, uh, <laughs> go and read The Children of Hurin, Oh, uh, yeah. And you'll see how dark it can get, what oh, the machine boy. leads to when Good Morgoth point. decides to take revenge yeah. on humanity, yeah, particularly in the person of, of Hurin, who is Good forced point. to watch the, the, the absolute tragedy of all, of all of his offspring. And we'll see some, somewhat of that in the Nar, Narne, uh, Ar Arnavidia, okay. the, the, the massive slaughter of, of all the elves uh, yeah. in a certain area. And we don't want to get too far ahead uh, of ourselves. it does get dark. Absolutely right. right. You're absolutely right. Yes. Tolkien, it's almost like Tolkien in, in that story is saying, you want Frankenstein? I'll give you Frankenstein. It was kind of like that. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's, it's terribly dark. Exactly. Exactly. He shows us he shows us what this kind of mentality leads to, which is why his work is about this. And if we need to understand that, if we're going to understand his work and his mindset and what yeah. it's about. And, and honestly, the, the long and the short of all this, excursus is that something was really really wrong in the collective unconscious by the 19th right. century you know something yeah. the zeitgeist the whatever you call it what had gone something like, has gone wrong. yeah and, and i think tolkien was you know he had seen action in um in world war one he'd seen what what uh they Shell fought was. with the machines he, right i mean that's he fought with the machines like directly, not metaphorically, not literarily, like directly fought with the machines. He had seen right. what artillery could do to human beings and right. gas. And, and, and he wasn't there when tanks were introduced, but certainly grenades and machine guns. And my like, God, how could you not come out of that kind of carnage, that, 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 that grist mill of the psalm and not say, hmm, something's wrong. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, you already see elements. If you go back, if you go back to Ambrose Bierce, for instance, in the 19th century, he was a guy who saw, saw action in the American Civil War, which some right. have argued is the first mechanized war. I think there's mm -hmm. some merit to that. But uh, Bierce came out of that, and well, there, there was a lot of sappy writing at the time of the Civil War. Okay, just put that on the mm -hmm. shelf for a minute. Because most people are like, oh, it's so syrupy, you know, I long for mother, and oh, little children with weepy eyes. Bierce came out of it, and he was so mad about what he had seen. That he wrote horrendous stories about it, just stories that mm -hmm. were filled with irony and horror and awfulness, and they're, they're they're quite good to read when you're when you're older. But he was already recognizing that by the 1860s, we had we had fallen into a bad place, and it wasn't we hadn't the Crimea hadn't happened yet, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and the uh, Spanish Civil War and the, all this they hadn't they hadn't happened yet. World War One and not happened yet, but it was it was getting bad already by the mid nineteenth yeah. century. Right, that's right. So, yeah, and we see that as as things begin to accelerate with um, you know the various anarchists throwing bombs into oh, parties yeah. and this kind of thing, and so the the growing as the machines are producing more and more efficiently, sort of introducing mass production of things, we're also introducing a more mechanized socially, like yes. I said, a social mechanism, and they begin to use that terminology to talk about society and politics and the state right. as a machine is mechanistically uh, causing carnage and destruction. Uh, though unless we zoom, if we don't zoom out far enough to look at it, we don't, we miss that point. But we right. see when we zoom out a picture of the whole. And two things on that, Kevin, you're absolutely right. Two things that are really not taught as vibrantly as they should be taught in most history courses. Okay. One of them is the revolutions of 1848. Yes. We, I think we have done in America, especially we've done a terrible job of saying just what a significant thing these were. Okay. The revolutions of 1848 were an example of the machine and also an outrage against the machine at the same time. Yes. Right. And the other thing that we don't teach enough of, and I don't know why we don't, is the whole anarchist movement that began there in the 1850s, roughly. Mm -hmm. the, and, and, and nationalists and socialists and national socialists and all these people that began 
anarchizing or whatever you want to say, advocating for just complete dissolution of governments because right. they were already perceiving something wrong and they were rebelling against it. It doesn't make what they did legitimate necessarily, but it no. is, this is what was happening in the mid to late 19th century, early 20th, even mm. before World War One. Most people like, oh yeah, Martin Luther King gets World War shot, War. and that's World War One. Yeah. He got shot because of a long line of people getting shot and bombs thrown at. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, that was just finally the straw that broke the camel's back in many ways. Yeah. 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 So that revolution of 1848. Just for a second, yes. on that. That not only what that was a revolt to some degree against the the perceived tyranny of kings kings in Europe. And it had started particularly around the, the French Revolution. Particularly, well, it was a continuation of that particular reaction in many quarters, not all, against the uh, the new aristocratic system that was established in the post-Napoleonic Europe. Good point. Good point. So yeah. Napoleon goes down. That that balloon deflates, and all yep. of a sudden there's a vacuum because he churned through everything else. And so Congress of Vienna, we're going to reconstitute various things. And so you've got an artificial structure now imposed on the people rather than, if you will, an organic aristocracy yeah. that had grown up. And in that way had spread the the cancer of what was the French aristocracy at the time of the French Revolution, or yes. at least the, the royal, those immediately atta attaché to the royal court. And that's a good word for it, a cancer, because it had started, if we take the French Revolution as a starting point, it had started there with good reason to a great degree because there's so much mismanagement and poverty and starvation that was going on. Mm -hmm. But that response was a response of uh, almost like people responding to their insignificance under the crown, under the French crown. Right. And that spread to other people thinking, well, I, I'm having a miserable time too, and it's not God's will. I'm going to do something about it. And th there was that foment that occurred, trying to be suppressed under Napoleon, tried to be suppressed after Napoleon in Vienna it didn't work. And so you had this massive right. riots and uh, open. So just break down everything, throw a bomb yes. into it. Yes, That's what, yeah. exactly. And then it produced, of course, it produced a manifesto, which tried to create a, a particular man like response. <laughs> yes, enough. that's exactly right. You know, yes, and saw history is manifesto. Yeah, the yes, country. this mechanized view of history of, you know, we, we tend to think that it's purely Hegelian. You've got a thesis, antithesis, bring into a synthesis. But really the image, the metaphor is, you know, like firing pistons, you know, in a gear that then turns around. That's how you yes. grind forward through history is the one fires up, and the other fires down, and we move the gear. Right. Uh, and that's, the, like you said, this machine view. And he's not the only one who takes a machine view, but he's one who, yeah. who, you know, who takes a machine view and moves it forward. And so this... This use of a machine as metaphor for society, the use of a machine in an explicit sense to achieve, uh, you know, one's to make one as Tolkien says in, in this letter here that for making one's will more effect more quickly effective. Mm -hmm. um, all the use of external plans or design. Uh, so the for the machine represents for him then all use of external plans or devices, and he uses particularly the word apparatus instead of development of the inherent inner powers or talents. So it's the externalizing of some locus of, of control and power into an apparatus, yeah. um, or even the use of these talents with the corrupted motive of dominating, but it's this exteriorized thing in order to bulldoze the real world and co coerce other wills, coercing other people towards coercion, towards sadism like the yep. Marquis de Sade you were talking about yep. earlier. This machine is our more modern, is obvious modern form <clears throat> of this. Uh, the machine is our more obvious modern form, but it's closely related to magic, more closely related to to magic, or I would say maybe sorcery than is usually recognized, because of yeah. course is the question of good magic versus bad magic, um, which is a discourse that's slightly alluded to in Lothlorien in Lord of the Rings, when uh, Gladriel says to Samwise, you wanted to see elf magic, though I'm not sure what you mean by that word, because you seem to use the same concept to refer to what we do in essentially participating in the song of creation to work wondrous things and what those those mechanistic apparatuses of the enemy the dark dark sauron and saruman do to manipulate reality yeah 
and, 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 and I think so. I, th I think that that instance that you just brought up of Galadriel's bafflement at this word magic is an interesting thing. The token was obviously noodling. You know, any good work of fantasy is going to have a good magical system because that's what yeah. fantasy. Fantasy is a uh, a magical system based, and science fiction is a uh, machine based thing. So right, they're like twin sisters or pillars of the same idea. But her bafflement really speaks to something too in that there is a very fine line between what emerges organically from a person creatively and this attempt to dominate others uh, and coerce their will. You know, there's, there's a very fine line between the two. Um, and we see that fine yeah. line sometimes being broken when you get an artist who thinks they're God, you know, or an actor who thinks mm -hmm. they're God. Um, because there are- to do something to- yeah, when you could do something to shock people, yeah, to or to, or dominate, to, to dominate public opinion, to, to yeah. make or them dominate, think a certain or, or way. literally, or literally dominate, because you know you yeah. go off to an Let's island see. with uh, some. What was that guy that killed himself? Uh, I forget his name. Anyway, um, <sighs> anyway, that guy who owned an island, right? And you go off to an island, and they bring you little little children to have your way with, you know, and and, and you can you deserve this because you're an actor, you know, you're an artist. Yeah, Perversities. You know, that's, it's perverse, but it is also like the Marquis de Sade. It's like that seeing other human beings as chattel or a resource to be stored up for later or what have you. Which is to I mean, it begins to sound, and it, we're working somewhere with this, so so bear with us here. Uh, it yeah. does begin to, this is, and this is in contrived with the organic flow of the conversation, uh, yeah. but it does begin to sound that people who do that kind of thing, and it's always other people, it's never me, right? It's, like, <laughs> it's us too, right? Uh, we, well, not that, but that, that particular instance, but we all do have this tendency there you go. To, to some degree or another, and there we need go. to repent of it, yep. of dominating others, viewing others as things to be used for, for some end or another, is that it's a move of really placing oneself on a, on a, on a, in a temple as, as a God of some sort. I don't mean like the omnipotent one God of, you know, the Abrahamic religions, but this kind of behavior sounds like the kind of stuff you see the Greek gods doing, you know, like this is all of a sudden you become Olympians in this yes. where you're making yourself into being Olympians. I've got power and I'm going to exert it over other people and turn into a bull to go cruise for <laughs> cruise yeah. for partners. It was like that old Saturday Night Live thing, right? Behold my butt. You cannot deny my butt, you know? <laughs> you know, the magnificence Zeus. of me. Um, but it, it, it goes back to that Galadriel thing, right? Her whole temptation in Lord of the Rings is a temptation to become this god. It's precisely and that, she, right? She says that explicitly. Exactly. And when, and what we will see through the course of the, the Silmarillion is her backstory is very complicated. Yes, she she has from the beginning. She is the most beautiful thing that's been created, uh, we find. But she has from the beginning this this lust for power. Yeah, this temptation, this tendency, this wanting to have a world of her own. Mm -hmm. um, and so when she says, "Long have I desired this," she means like thousands of years. Yeah, she, she means has yearned for yeah. this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Lothlorien is in some ways a subset of that. I mean, the whole reason yeah. Lothlorien is so beautiful is because she set her mind to making this little garden. Exactly, to replicate, the... precisely to replicate the place from which she's been banished. That's exactly but right. We'll, we'll see that when we get to it. Or to stay, you know, you could say to stave off the inevitable mortality yes. that she would have to face. So right. she, so true. even though we love, you know, in Lord of the Rings, which we're skipping ahead a little bit, but in Lord of the Rings, you love Lothlorien, you love Galadriel, they're wonderful, but even she has to realize, I must fade and go into the West. Right. I have to leave behind this garden that I've made, mm. or lest I become this dark queen. Exactly. And it seems to me that that's, Again, we're looking at a problem which Tolkien was recognizing in his own culture. And it was a problem which every human being alive today, every human being alive before us even, has had to grapple with it. But it has been made more possible by the exponential advancement of the physical tools of the machine. And I'm not just talking, I do this automatically, right? <laughs> I'm not just talking that the handheld devices or the internet. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the creation of societal ways of acting, of uh, entertainment systems, 
of uh, mm -hmm. governmental systems, even a social interaction. All these are are to some degree coerced to be part of the machine. Even a slight mm -hmm. example, even a side, side example here. I personally am, am I'm deeply in favor of American democracy, okay? I'll just let that out of the bag there. The way that the founding fathers set up this nation is unparalleled, wonderful, and has borne great fruit. But I have to acknowledge that it is a machine. It's a machine in order to combat the vices that they say are inevitable in human beings. And mm -hmm. it's a machine of government which has a tendency to become a bureaucracy, a Kafka-esque bureaucracy. And they recognized that. They had no way to stop it. So when they started there creating this government in 1783, I think, when the Constitution was finalized, when they created that government, they set in motion something which could metastasize into the Leviathan that we are trying to deal with now, okay? Yes. We're part, in other words, that's part of that machine thing mm -hmm. that has made it easier for people to give in to this tendency to um, enact their will over other people. Exactly. Okay. So the machine is not just like you said, these things, but also the mechanization of society, the mechanization yep. of the state, yep. uh, and so on. And I think that's, I think that the, the American democracy is a great example in many ways, parallel to, or reminiscent of Frankenstein's um, yeah. hopes, and, and, and actually what we see, the early life of Frankenstein's creature. Yep. It has great promise. It has great hope in the beginning, uh, begins to learn and is desired, it has des uh, is, is won over by beauty and is yeah. desirous of virtue and it has yeah. all these great plans of what it can do and like, things yeah. start to go awry and then and then it, then it becomes evil and starts killing people and then, you know, we see that, that, that poignant face off between Frankenstein yeah. and, and the monster that you are my creator, but I am your master now. And, and, and we're at a point now we're in America, especially, but I think it's global. We're at a point mm -hmm. now where we have to ask Quo Vadis, what, where are we going? What do we, what do we do with it? I mean, if this is the case that we have this government system or this tech, this industry of entertainment or this technological yeah. system, this entirely social or this entire social yeah. machine, yeah. The yeah. machine, you've got the machine, you're in the yeah. machine. It's right. like, you can't just um, pull the plug out and be free like Neo. No, into what though? This dystopian. Like you can't do that. See, you can't, but you can't do that. And, you know, I have a lot of monarchist friends and um, they want to go back to monarchy. And I don't know, but perhaps you uh, can sympathize with this to some degree. Yes. They want to go back to a monarchy. But it's very difficult, I think, to go back. You, you know? can't go back. And I think that's one of the things that Tolkien struggles with, yeah. not struggles with, but is showing us the struggle yes. of. Yes, yes, yes. Because he himself was monarchist, actually, from what I understand. Absolutely. Been blessed to live in a monarchy his whole life. Right. But um, you can't go back, and yet you can't really, the trajectory that we're moving towards is very dark, it seems, very dark. And uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see a solution. I don't know if Tolkien did, but I, I think that certainly understanding the problem is crucial if we're going to find any solution, or at least if we're going to survive... <laughs> through the, the modern era. You know, there's a really funny right. image, which I don't know if I, I could find it and put it up here, but it was a Charlie Chaplin who sure. um, has, you know, Charlie Chaplin, actor in the early part of the 20th century, and he did a number of, of great movies. And one of these great movies that he did, and I, I think, I don't remember the name of the movie. Was it Hard, Hard Times, perhaps? But it's okay. one where he is caught in the gears of this uh, yes. machine. Right, modern times. That's what it was. He's caught in the gears of this machine, and he can't get out. He's like stuck in the gears. Ah, here it is. I'll show you. Uh, um, uh, lolly, lolly, lolly. Open image. Here it is. Yeah, he's caught in the gears of the machine. And what's really funny about this scene is that he goes through the machine gears, and he kind of just like laughs and enjoys the ride. <laughs> so he comes out on the other end. <laughs> Just blue, blue, blue. Oh, yeah. But I'm often thinking about that with the machine. Uh, and by the way, if anybody wants to do a really interesting study, <clears throat> go back and look at old silent films. Hard Times, for instance, The Tramp, 
uh, Metropolis, for instance, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, even things like All Quiet on the Western Front. And you'll see almost all of these movies are to some of the crowd, right? They're all dealing mm. with the machine to some degree. Almost all of these ancient uh, or these old uh, black and white movies, they're dealing with the machine. It's much yeah. more stark than modern movies. Okay. So Metropolis being one of my absolute favorites on that score. It's a, it's a great yeah. image of what the machine does to human beings. Uh, Wings is another good example. So, so the question, and I, was it in, in, not in defense of monarchy or monarchism per se, but I think we can easily get caught into a paradigm, especially those, who, those of us who live in modern republics, mm -hmm. to imbibe the notion that monarchy is something that was back then and now we live in a republic. So anything would be going backwards, yeah. even if you're not going back in time, you're somehow reverting to a previous state. It's important to remember that many countries along, around the world still are monarchies. Right. Uh, Liechtenstein, not least of them, right? Yeah, the Principality of Liechtenstein, Principality of Andorra, Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, for that matter, the Kingdom of Belgium as well as the obvious United Kingdom and, you know, Spain yep. and many other places. Greece, and so, so, yeah, uh, Greece it? has a, they kicked him out in the seventies. There was okay. a revolution. There was lots of, comp things are complicated. Okay. Uh, he recently died though. Um, but the, uh, lots of places or still today, Nepal, um, or Bhutan, one of the two, anyway, uh, are, are monarchies, which says two things. One is that, that's not a move backwards. That's just a different form of government. And if we look historically, republics have come and gone, monarchies have come and gone, nations of people have switched back and forth between them as suits the time. Um, but uh, the second thing that it points out is simply having a monarchy like Belgium, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Spain, does not make you immune from these problems either. Right. 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 And so it's not just the form of government that you have, but the way in which it's, uh, it's carried out and, and lived by the people. I'm glad you said that because there, you know, the debate, especially among conservatives, because a lot of conservative people, they, they don't know what to do. They're baffled by it. They're terrified by it. And they're trying mm -hmm. to find ways to fix it. But the ways are always like retreating, going back to communal living, small living, uh, like the, uh, the Benedict option. Um, going to uh, change, overthrow government, reestablish a democracy, or um, go back to monarchy, or whatever it is. Go back to the traditional form of the church, whatever. Right. But what I think a lot of people don't recognize is that whatever change we make, this is still a problem. This machine thing is still a problem. And it's precisely, it's not going to go away just because we have a different form of government or because we make a, a self sustaining small community. It's still there. <sighs> Now, there's those, and those are two different orders of things. One, I think, I think the root of the problem is that the notion that simply a change of government will, will solve the problem is itself machine thinking. What apparatus can I apply to the problem to solve the problem? What's needed is, is metania, is, is interior conversion which can bear fruit in, I mean, so there are some practical things. It's not just some spiritual exercise because that's also a response that we've seen historically, the you know, quietist kind of movements, individual, you know, individualism itself sort of is, is a way of trying to cope with this yeah. by saying we need to um, you know, just have interior spiritual conversion and it'll all be hunky-dory, which I think comes down to simply how I learned to stop worrying and love the, uh, love the machine, right? <laughs> You're just riding it down. Um, <laughs> Like that's not a solution either, but real interior conversion has to bear fruit in action. And I think there are practical things that have to change um, that you may see smaller sustainable communities, not because it's romantic you know, in the sense of the romantic movement, right. but that, you know, the guy who wrote you know, the whole small is beautiful kind of thing is that there's a sense that human scale is just healthier and it's not machine scale. So a shift from massive machine the ways that we construct our lives, maybe shifting from constructing a machine-like existence at a machine scale for our lives to changing to a whole different paradigm of cultivating a life that's at a human scale is just going to look different. So I think there are practical things in the yes. social and political sphere where we need to have those kinds of conversations. But where do you start? Yeah. Heidegger's analysis of modern technology, there are a lot of people writing at the same time, Tolkien included, um, is 
you know, he starts with this problem, the question concerning technology, which I think right. was published in 1954, something like that. Um, and just to say, he also famously, famously did, he renounced in accepting a professorial position in Berlin to live in the Black Forest among the peasants. And he wrote an essay as to why I'm living here and not there. And that might be instructive to the qu previous question we were just addressing. Yeah, right. Um, but he says, everywhere we remain unfree and chained to technology, whether we passionately affirm it or deny it, but we are delivered over to it in the worst possible way when we regard it as something neutral. But this conception of it, to which today we particularly like to do homage, makes us utterly blind to the essence of technology. So we remain unfree and chained to it, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. right? Whether we like it or not, we're chained to it. So this, pre this presents a problem for us. Mm -hmm. That's very, and that's very reminiscent to things that were being responded to as early as the, uh, the 1800s, you know, uh, Rousseau writing in the 1700s, which, you know, take it for what it's worth, man is born free and everywhere is in chains, or um, mm -hmm. uh, Blake again with the uh, mind-forged manacles that he's so opposed to. So right. Heidegger seems to suggest that unless we recognize that there's this problem, you know, Unless we, mm -hmm. we try to, as you said, metanoia, try to have an examination of ourselves, uh, we are, we're in the worst possible way, <laughs> right? Because we think it's all, we think it's all fine. TV is fine. Uh, right. We think it's just neutral. fine, you know, but it's actually, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an, en an enslaving technology. It has more tendency to enslave us than it does to actually liberate our will. Mm-hmm. Which tangentially, let me just, there are so many good books to read on this. One of them is The Mechanical Bride by Marshall McLuhan. And mm -hmm. Marshall McLuhan suggests that technology at the time, which was radio and TV technology, uh, and his stuff carried on by Neil Postman, who was his disciple, uh, yeah. he was writing at the dawn of the internet age. He suggests that every uh, technology is an extension of the human system. So when we get into these technologies, what ends up happening is we think that they are enacting our will, but what they're actually doing is they're allowing us to be open to the influence of somebody else on the other end who is trying to keep us as a resource, trying to keep us inert as a resource to be used for the release of power at some future date, either as McLuhan says, the power to buy stuff. And right. he says, he puts it as, um, keeping human beings in a prolonged state of mental rutting, right? Mm -hmm. His mechanical bride is a combination of violence and sex put together, mm -hmm. which are the two base gods of human existence. And that right. combination makes us all inert because we're constantly, almost narcissistically, thinking about how we can acquire that lovely Lamborghini or how we can get a white collared shirt or how we can get that one delicious wine or whatever it is. We're always mentally rutting, but without any production of anything at all. And so we right. end up, um, McLuhan suggests, almost like cord wood being stacked as a resource, ready to be um, used by somebody else when they need us. Which is quite a terrifying concept, yeah. but if we, if, but if we're aware of it, we have the possibility of repenting, so to speak, to use a Christian. Yeah, of 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 not answering the palantir when someone yeah. calls, yeah. for example. Yeah, um, and that's and as you said, Denethor thinks that he's seeing into things, and he is seeing things, but he's only seeing what we could say the machine wants him to see. Uh, you know, even Saruman is is going tete-a-tete -tete with Sauron, but doesn't realize he's slowly being subverted, um, uh, you know, in, into these other things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's and it's something, in, it was, it's just something endemic in the machine itself then that has this subverting quality. Yeah. That's distinct and from artistic poesis. Tolkien embodies this as early in this work, as early as Aina Lundale, because yeah. He suggests that the machine, which isn't yet the machine, is actually akin to the void. And when yeah. um, when when Melkor, who's not yet Morgoth, when Melkor goes off to seek the light, he's not really seeking it where it should be found, which is in Iluvatar. He's seeking it in the void. He goes off into the void to look for yeah. the light. Yeah, so even he Why in some ways is being manipulated. 
That's exactly it. Yeah, it's, it's sucking, like a vacuum, right? I mean, it's right. sucking him in, into the void. So the machine is then all so many portals into the void of nothingness. Yeah, you know, I was reading an article somewhere where the art, the author was saying oh. that to some degree, the cell phone is a portal to a demonic world. Was that something yeah. you shared with me? Paul Kingsnorth was writing it. He's got a short story, very creepy, short series of, of fictitious letters uh, back and forth about this theme. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It was really very insightful, I think. I, to some degree, that is, I, I think, I accurate because... Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day where they were bringing up um, the idea that the demonic is the demonic is nothing more than the normalization of horrors, horrible mm -hmm. things being considered normal. That's the demonic. Yes. So if we're looking at a a, a machine that allows us to see on a regular basis from dawn to dusk horrible things. Wouldn't that be a portal into hell? That's that would be oh. literally it. Yeah. Yeah. And what you, see, what you see, you get explicit into. way. Yeah. Sorry. Well, absolutely. I say in the most explicit way. Really, it's not even like metaphorically. That's just what that is. <laughs> yes. And and it, and it does influence you, um, in a profound way. I mean, to to degrees that neuro, neuro, neurologically and it's designed to. And that's the other thing. So we've we've created a thing just to harp on this particular technology um, we've created a thing based on certain knowledge that we have we have the technology to create this thing which itself is then imbued with the mechanical capacities because of the the patterns of light structures that we believe we're see that recreate that make us think we're seeing an image right and and cause us to click through in certain ways to touch to touch really because at the end of the day what I'm just touching a black I'm, I, bum, bum, yeah, right. bum. <laughs> you know, I'm just touching a black obelisk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Next thing I know, monkeys are killing each other and yeah, right? in space. Yeah. Um, that's you that's an it. uncanny similarity I had not recognized before. No, Thank you're you, right. Hubert. You're absolutely right. It's uh, Arthur C. Clarke was uh, definitely onto yeah. something there in a scientific way, it's like you know, science right. and fantasy. They're two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. He's onto something. Yes, and that this is the capacity to then actually interface with my gray matter in a mechanical way. Because yep. so much of when I pick this up and use it, turn it on, and the lights are shining at my face, it's, it is able to, directly through the ocular mechanism, manipulate certain configurations within within the brain like that's how yeah. this addictive behavior works that's why i mean it's, it goes back to why casinos have these bright shiny lights yeah, right well, that yes. kind of same same logic just much more highly sophisticated and pocket sized uh, but is able to then stimulate you to do certain actions in a dyadic way where you're just merely responding to stimuli rather than being able to think and reflect as a rational human being you're behaving more like an animal yep and what we think is going on is that we mm -hmm. are enacting our will. Okay, that's what exactly. we think. That's the illusion. Because, oh, we can make comments, we can make snarky comments and get away with it. We're invisible, it's like wearing the ring. Uh, and we can see anything we want and we can you know, um, uh, force other people to do things. What we don't realize is that we are being manipulated. We think we're exactly. manipulating, we are being manipulated. We're being, uh, we are being forced to become part of the machine through not just that object, but other objects as well, other pieces, and also by cultural things. Mm -hmm. We're being forced to yield up our resource. What is our resource, right? Our resource is our own will and our own physical body and our own mental capacity. We're being mm -hmm. forced to yield up our resource so that we become agents of some other power. And this right. is exactly what Heidegger is pointing out. Yes, I was going to say this, that, that point there, that there's another power at work, and this is, uh, you know, Kings North and a few others have talked about this, that there's a way, why do we talk about the, the machine as a thing and, and not merely man's tendency to use technology, is that the thing in many ways has evolved to be, in some ways, like one might, you know, ancient peoples might say, there's a God behind that, yeah. that is using us to exert its will. We right. become the tools of the machine rather than the machine being a tool that we use. Right. And that's where that fundamental shift is from. And that's where I think, you know, where Heidegger is saying, just to go forward with this, 
um, point. He says the revealing of the, 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 the sort of the discovery, the manifestation that holds sway in modern technology does is different categorically from the artistic process, creation of something. So it doesn't have this bringing forth in the sense of poesis, what an artist or poet does. The revealing that rules the modern technology is a challenging, rather, this herausforderung, which is that rebellion, um, yeah. which puts to nature the unreasonable demand. So now so the, the shift, the creation is making a demand on nature, the unreasonable demand that it supply energy that can be extracted and stored as such. Yeah. But does this not hold, is it, but, but on the other hand, does this not hold true for the old, old windmill as well? No, it does not. The windmill sails do indeed turn in the wind but they are left entirely to the winds blowing. They don't unlock and extract energy from the air currents in order yeah. to store it. Yeah, and by the way, this translation is not very good just for the record, but mm -hmm. that word there, had uh, a challenging, it is challenging, yes, but it is also, it has a, a connotation of a violent, a violent opposition to. Right, it's, Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. the fool. The, the, the hand under the chin. For, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a violent yep. challenging. It's not just like, I don't think you're right. No, it's fatu right. mater, you know, that kind of thing. It's, yeah, exactly. It's supposed to ex that's extract right. a, a violence out of the other person, almost like a... Yes, <laughs> sorry. I'm thinking of the Dark Crystal movie from the 1980s. Yes. Right. Thank you. That's what I was going to go into it as the blue light shining on the face and just sucking the soul Essence out of, of these. Gelfling. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Yes. If yes. you haven't seen the Dark Crystal, you need to see the Dark Crystal. That was done. But don't do it. It'll ruin your souls, but you'll be wiser for it, but darker <laughs> for it. It's... But you're right. Why, for instance, does the machine in its mm. most obvious form, which is the handheld device in the computer, why does it have a blue light that that we sit and stare at until our eyes are watering, until they're red? You Why couldn't make it any more explicit. Oh my <laughs> the gosh. connection there. It's really amazing. Ooh, to yeah. yeah. But I mean, this same Herausforderung can be seen in other respects as well, okay? Because it's right. not, I mean, I, I hammer on, on the cell phone and the, and the computer because I've grown to love and hate them at the same time. But right. we can see it in other respects. Um, this modern technology, for instance, of uh, say government or this modern technology mm -hmm. of social uh, pressure or of entertainment does a similar thing. It challenges mm -hmm. you in a violent way so that your resources are then a patsy. They are, right. <laughs> they are rendered inert enough either through your own response of anger or your own feeling of inadequacy or your own addictions they're mm -hmm. rendered so inert that you aren't a challenge anymore yourself to whatever the power is but you are ready to be manipulated by the power when the power chooses to manipulate here we are now entertain us yeah here we are now yeah. entertain us yes a great example it's like, oh and that response of the you know <laughs> great song uh, they were rebelling. Uh, the whole grunge movement was rebelling against what they perceived that, as tremendous. Right, right. And and unfortunately, it doesn't end well for like no. Bay, right? Like that's because you need something else. Yeah. Uh, you need, you can't just throw bombs into it and and expect anything but World War One to come out of that. No, uh, you, you can't. You can't socially or personally. Yeah. And, and I'm so scrolling, I'm scrolling down here because I wanted mm -hmm. I want to point something out that Heidegger says, which is almost yes. directly connected to Tolkien. And this I know he's writing mm -hmm. after Tolkien, but they're you know they're contemporaneous. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he's writing here about the Rhine River, mm -hmm. major river in Germany, source of all sorts of wonderful pieces of artwork and music and the like for centuries. Mm -hmm. But here he's writing about the hydroelectric plants that are built on the Rhine River. And you might say, well, Heidegger just had it out for our hydroelectric plants. No, it's not here. Yeah, how is that different from the old uh, water mill? Right. He says uh, the hydroelectric plant is set into the current of the Rhine. It sets the Rhine to supplying its hydraulic pressure, which then sets the turbines turning. This turning sets those machines in motion whose thrust sets going the electric current, for which the long distance power station and its network of cables are set up to dispatch electricity. In the context of the interlocking processes pertaining to the orderly disposition of electrical energy, even the Rhine itself appears as something at our command. That's the key thing here. Even these mm. powerful forces of nature appear to be under our control, our command. 
The hydroelectric plant is not built into the Rhine as was the old wooden bridge that joined bank with bank for hundreds of years. Rather, the river is dammed up into the power plant. What the river is now, namely a water power supplier, derives from out of the essence of the power station. And by that, that's what he's getting at here when he says the Rhine appears at our command. No longer is nature just a thing in and of itself. It is now a means to an end. Okay? And it derives out mm. of the essence of the power station, derives from out of the essence of the power station. In order that we may even remotely consider the monstrousness that reigns here, let us ponder for a moment the contrast that speaks out of the two titles the Rhine as stand up into the power works and mm. the Rhine as uttered out of the artwork and Holder lines him by that name. Monstrousness, it's monstrous, Heidegger says. It's a monster, Yes. right? And so that's what, that seems then to mark the difference between the work of the, uh, you know, the, the Cistercian monks in creating these canals to move water wheels and all of that back yeah. in the you know 12 1300s uh, to the peasant working the soil of the field he's not challenging the soil of the field when he works the field sowing of grain this is just to, to, to pull more from Heidegger here in the sowing of grain the peasant places the seed in keeping with the forces of growth and watches over its increase but meanwhile even the cultivation of the field is in the modern order the cultivation of the field has come under the grip of another kind of setting in order which sets upon nature yep. it imposes a new uh pattern framework uh it sets upon nature. this to, to, to stell to, it, it yep. stelts upon nature um it sets upon a sense of challenge in the sense of challenging it in the sense of rebelling against it. Agriculture in the mechanized food industry now is different than the agriculture of the peasant. Air is set upon to yield nitrogen, the earth to yield ore, ore to yield uranium. For example, uranium is set to yield atomic energy, which can be released either for destruction or peaceful use. But right. it's the sense that all these elements, the nature, the world is broken down into elements and they're there for us to extract if only we use the precise tool to do it, which yeah. means this is this is this is what we do with other people too. And just to go on a little philological wonder journey here for a second, um, the like stelt here, this this verb stellen, is, he uses this to with the, the sense of to set upon or to put into place, is related to the word gestalt. In fact, gestalt mm -hmm. is sort of the past tense. Uh, the past, whatever you know, it, it, a thing that has been stelt, right? Gestalt um, it, is the German word for essentially, in the sense of that which has put in, to, has been put into order. You may have heard of the concept of Gestalt psychology, something like right. that. Gestalt is the sense of the whole, a whole thing, or secondarily, a certain configuration, if you will. Uh, so similar to the sense of in, in Latin to to make to shape something to be a certain way is formare, and, and the thing shaped is the formata. That's what gestalt is. So gestalt is about seeing the thing as a whole, which is the opposite of this tendon, the modern mechanism, the machine tendency to break things into pieces and elements. Gestalt means indivisible. It's an indivisible whole that can own that is only what it is insofar as it is a complete whole, not a heap of parts. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Uh, it reminds me of two things. Um, one is uh, our conversation earlier dwelt on food. I like mm -hmm. food. Um, I don't like Taco Bell. Okay. Um, and the, the mach food traditionally was designed to be pleasing to the eye, nourishing mm -hmm. and delicious. And you still see that in really good restaurants, really good cooks, really good cultures that produce food as a communal thing to bring people together. Unites, right. creates this sense of, of, of um, satisfaction and order and beauty. It, it, food used to be something that contributed to, if I can use the term, I hope I use it correctly, contributed to the gestalt, it contributed mm -hmm. to the sense that things were in order. That's why you set a place right. setting, right? You set the tables. Okay? Yes, exactly. And all of this is that same word. Yeah. Right. And yeah. the machine doesn't do that. The machine produces food on a massive scale in bits and parts, finds out like what would be the most uh, efficient and economically feasible and finds out what would be the, the, the basic components that we absolutely need and breaks them apart. 
And then it shoves that to people in, a, in an unappetizing way because appetizing is uh, unmeasurable, I suppose. It's superficial. Yeah, and so you end you up can't with Taco Bell. That. You know, you end up with Taco Bell squirting a paste into a cup for you to put over your nose, which is a totally, you know, it's a totally different thing. A, a, another which is, I was just to, to, to transition forward, is that's a rat, all, all of this then is a radically different way. Uh, is, is a radically different thing, a way of radically different way of seeing and a radically different way of being than what we see in Gerard Manley Hopkins. The, the world is charged with the grandeur of God shining like shook foil. And that's where we'll be able to say, okay, we've gone through the Marquis de Sade and Taco Bell and I didn't see anywhere really I knew in here. <laughs> you know, <what's, laughs> is there. We're making gritty and tangible through our experience, what Tolkien just sang, what the Ainur just sang about yeah. the creation of the world and more Melkor Morgoth's um, dissonance, his rebellion against that song. This is what that that this is yes. what that looks like. Yes, and 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 honestly, Cameron, we're going to have to have another session to get. Yes, to, we have to continue. Yeah, I know, Linda. Like, all right, to get to the second part of the get to the goal. It's too much. But here's one here's one other thought on this. Um, that the <laughs> that sense that things should be broken down to their parts and controlled and made into power that blake saw this as happening all over and even happening in religion mm -hmm. absolutely and blake said that the religion the christian religion in england at the time 19th mm -hmm. century had been coerced to become a vehicle of the state to oppress people. Hmm. If like he else. had used this language, he would have said, religion has become part of the machine. Yes. And we certainly see that in Marx in 1848 when he's, or not, explicitly he, says it. 53. He says right, explicitly, right. religion is the opiate of the masses. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't like Marx, okay? I don't, Communist Manifesto, I, bleh. But, but he's making he an observation. He's making an observation of the fact of his day. Yes. What he sees. Yes. Yeah. What he saw, what Blake saw, what Wordsworth saw, what many people saw and mm -hmm. still do see, religion in the West, as we know it, has to many degrees become part of the machine. The God has become part of the machine. He is your buddy Jesus, right? <laughs> <laughs> there is so it, there are, there are machine gods and there are the real gods. Yes, and they're at opposition. Yes, total opposition. That's what, as far that's apart we'll as have. X is, you know, or Z is right. A, you know, as the rising of the sun is to the setting. Rising of the sun is to the setting. Um, and and you you know, testimony to this. I hate to say this, testimony to this is the hypocrisy that is frequently called out of politicians who proclaim to be part of the religion, and yet advocate for horrendous things, mm -hmm. completely contrary to the religion as it should be, as it was. And yet there's no, huh. there's no problem with it. There's no contradiction there. That's just, that's the way it is. That's right. That there should be hypocrisy is one thing, but that it's just seen as perfectly normal. Yes. Is that's the state. That's what makes it something particularly the, the, horrendous. The, the normalization of horrors. Right. With the demonic. Yeah. There it is. And in such cases, the old gods, if we can call them that, are compromised or dead. One or the right. other. That's, by the way, that's Nietzsche. what I think Nietzsche was saying. Nietzsche was saying that's that God that. is dead. God is dead. We've killed him. Right. You made the machine gods to, to reign over you instead. Right. You've done away with the other or the others, whatever your particular flavor is. And, um, but, but there is a pervasive fear and hope that they might reassert their 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 dominance yes. uh, in the in the theomachy that is playing out and that's what we will have to dive into in the next episode right right um <laughs> that is exactly a, what we need to dive into the, in the next meeting and i think that's a good place for us perhaps to, to um, be continued to be continued dun 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 <laughs>
you should really end this with like uh just somehow cut off in the middle of the conversation is will they ever get there <laughs> <laughs> no we will no we'll join in next there. week to find out patience young hop you're very fast people <laughs> don't let's and be too hasty class. i can't believe we didn't say let's not be too hasty let's not be too hasty <laughs> <laughs> there <laughs> Clip that inserted every once in a while. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Cameron, thank you again. It's been marvelous. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and and I'll I'll um I'll I think we should end these sessions with our normal uh, salutation from the Hobbit, uh, which I'm calling yes. the acrylic, the acrylic salutation. You know, after the, the acrylic language. salutation. I like that. So, my friend, farewell wherever you fare. To Aries, receive you at the journey's end. And may the wind under your wings bury you to where the, sun's, the moon sails and the sun walks.